uh, that you allows you to reason about the resource usage of uh, programs or here expressions yeah, and what was uh, the meaning of that. So here in this context gamma we had these potential annotations that defined a linear potential. Yeah, and we also have this constant potential here Q and uh, together with this input potential in the gamma um, it kind of like defines the uh, initial potential and you have to use it to pay for the cost of E and the potential of the uh, result if it terminates which is given by the annotations in this type B and the Q prime. Okay, and we looked at a, a few of the type rules already. So here for instance, uh, the variable rule, it says like, okay, so if you have a variable that is, has type B, um, then you can return something of, of the same type um, and you have to have constant potential that is sufficient to pay for the cost of the uh, lookup of the variable um, plus uh, the constant potential that you have after the evaluation. Yeah, so that's a, a variable rule. And here this um, M, that is kind of like a, a, a metric that defines what the cost is and the, the user can define what it, what it is. It can be uh, negative and then resources are returned. So at that point, uh, the variable rule probably will never be negative, um, but could be in, in, uh, theoretically. So another rule here is um, the function application. So in, when you have a function application, uh, what you do is you look up uh, a type in your um, function signature, sigma, okay, and we said like, we remember the, the type of, of append where you needed multiple types so you can have different um, um, potential annotations for functions, so that's why this is a set, okay? And what we do then is we have to have here, well, um, this input potential as given by A because that's what, what's required here by, by the argument and we also have to have sufficient constant potential to um, pay for the cost of the application, M app, and the input potential that's required by the function. And what we get then in the end is the return type as given by the function uh, plus uh, this constant return potential, uh, P prime. Okay, and um, here are the, the other rules you've seen last time, yeah, for the pattern match and, and for the let, and the rules for the a pattern match and also for lists and also for the list cons. They are interesting because there you have this interaction between the linear annotations and the constant potential, right? So what happens here in the cons rule is you um, kind of um, have to pay uh, not only for the cost of the cons with the co uh, constant potential that you have but also for the potential that you assign to the head of the list. Yeah, so that's why you have the uh, P up here. Okay, so what I want to do first today before we look at the other rules, um, I want to show you how you uh, uh, use, uh, before we look at the other rules, I want to show you how you use uh, these rules to um, um, do a type derivation for a pant that we've seen last time. So um, the question is, which type are we using here? Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're using a type for a pend um, that looks as follows. Oh yeah, it's not int, it's bool. Into integers here, but that doesn't make a difference. So, and we've seen last time that there are multiple ways I can annotate it. Again, um, um, as uh, in the last lecture, we are interested in the number of cons operations. So, and this is linear in the size of the first argument. So, um, 
One type we could give it was just like, okay, you have one potential unit per element in the first list, zero in the second list, and then zero, zero, zero here. But um, another one that you might use in an uh, inner use of append is where you have two potential units for the first list, one for the second, zero constant, and what you get is zero constant, and one for the output list. Okay, and now we going to do a type derivation for this. So to start with, um, if we want to justify uh, this type, yeah, we take um, the annotations on the arguments and add it uh, to a context. So uh, what we're going to have is, so we have the axis, um, which have annotation two here, and we have the y's that have annotation one. Okay, and for the constant ones, we take what's written on the arrow here, zero, zero, and um, we have to type the body of the function. Okay, this is how we justify this. Okay, so for the function body, so the first rule um, that we have to apply is the rule for pattern matching. So, the match rule. And there we have to do two things. So the first thing is we have to um, type this E1 here, which is just the, the Y's, yeah, and uh, to do that, we can take the gamma, yeah, which is um, this y's here, yeah, which, which you see at the rule, and um, that's what we're going to do. So we have the um, y's, this potential annotation one, and we have the same um, constant input and output potential, yeah, as specified here. Uh, by the rule because like we have zero cost yeah, in our metric, we count only the number of cons operations, so that's why nothing is happening here. And we have the y's and yeah, um, we have to justify still our uh, list type here at the end. And yeah, this is simple, so what, which rule can we apply now? Yes, exactly. Just the variable rule. And we're done, right? Yeah, that's exactly what the variable rule says. I mean, again, here, our metric says it's zero, right? So the Q is equal to Q prime, and we have the same type B here um, um, for our variable. So that, that, that is easy. More interesting is the part of the uh, E2 here. Yeah, so there uh, what happens is this um, axis gets split up. So we have um, x of type bool and we have axis prime that has um, annotation two to it. And we have the y's still with one. And then um, what we get is uh, this annotation two here of the hat that is going to show up here, okay? And again, at the end, we have to have zero. Okay. So now we look at the um, E2, and we have to use uh, the rule um, for um, let. Okay, so now I have to watch out with the space here, maybe. Uh, we do the 
um, E1 first. So <clears throat> for the E1, we can just use the Ys. Yeah, so what we have to do is we have to split up um, our context here. And so how are we going to split up our context? So we have three things in the context. And um, what are we going to use for the E1? And what are we going to use for the E2? Yeah, so we have this linear type system. So which of the um, um, variables are used in the E1? Yeah, the E1 is this part here. So the, what we use is the x is prime and the y's, OK? So this part of the context has to go um, to the E1. So and the E1 is the pend x is prime and y's. So here, um, well, we have to use the two here that, that is um, um, our input potential yeah, to um, feed it into the E1. But um, the output here, this is kind of like something we still have to determine. And I say it's a good idea to put two here. OK? Also here, um, this type is, is not given to us. This is something we have to come up with. And I say it's a good idea um, to also put a list of type two here. OK. So now. Which rule do we want to apply here? Function application, exactly. So however, um, we have a problem here. So if you look at the rule for function application, yeah, and again, our m app is 0 here, yeah. Um, so, what type should we have here on the on the arrow? Well, zero zero is what what we have, but what we want is two two. So there we have to first um, apply a rule that we call relax. You haven't seen it yet, but it just says like okay. If you have a, a constant potential, then you can always pass it through. So here, um, we apply the relax rule. And we say, like, OK, you have the same thing. But just with 0, 0. And the rule says, like, OK, in general, if you have something with q, q prime, then you can just add a constant to both sides. Yes? Uh, sorry, sorry, which type are you talking about? This one here? Oh, yeah, right. This is wrong. Okay. Yeah, so the question is why it's here 2. And um, it has to, of course, um, be a 1. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I mean, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, otherwise we would run into trouble in the next rule that, that, that we apply. Exactly. Thanks. OK, and now. Um, 
we have it in, in the right format where we can just say, okay, now we have our sigma um, of pend in a, a form where, where we can use it. So uh, to one and the zeros here and the one. Okay, so now the only thing that's missing is the um, second part of the let. Yeah, this is not going to be pretty. So yeah, this this belongs to to the let rule still. Yeah, the e two. Um, okay, and here um, we have to use the leftover that we didn't use in the e one, which is the x in this case. And we also get the result of the append, which has the name t here. And we feed that into, so here we know also what to use for the, for the constant one, namely uh, the two here we have uh, left from the e1, and we have to produce a zero as uh, given here in the let. And the, our term is cons x t. And um, the list annotation is also clear, has to be uh, L1. Okay. And here we can simply use the cons rule. Okay. Um, why? So we have to pay one for the cost of cons. Remember that we are counting the number of cons operations, okay? And we have to use the other one to pay for the cost, uh, for the potential that we attach to the head of the list. So that makes all sense. Cool. So we'll come back to that later uh, when we're going to look at um, type inference. But for now, um, I want to show you um, the remaining type rules, or at least some of them. Um, so you've seen already um, that we needed um, this relax rule, okay? And the relax rule is a, a, a structural rule, so it's not syntax directed, so you can apply it at any time. And there are like a few of these structural rules that you need. Um, Similar, you know, as in the, in the function application, it's kind of like, you know, when things are not just right, but you can already see it's correct to change it. And this is like expressed in these um, structural rules. So, yeah, let's maybe start right away with, with a, a relax rule. So, So if you want to like have the constants q and q prime here, so what you can do is you can use the same gamma to derive type judgment with p and p prime. The rest stay the same. And what you can do is, so you can say like, okay, I start with a little bit more potential. So q is greater than p. Yeah can never hurt to, to have more, uh, your bound gets weaker. And um, then you have to say that the difference between Q and P is bigger than the difference uh, between Q prime and P prime. So, That's a bit close together, sorry. 
<clears throat> yeah, so that, that's basically okay. Um, so at the end, um, you can always have uh, a little less potential. So let's say like the, um, Difference, let's say like the p is equal to q, so you don't start uh, with more. Then it simply says that the um, p prime is less than the q prime. And that's exactly what we want. So for instance, like it, it, it is um, subsumed in this rule that you can add the constant on both sides. Yeah, you can, can do uh, the mass. So, um, Another rule um, that is very similar is the subtyping. So sometimes you want to, for instance, um, throw away a little bit of potential that you have attached to a list, um, for instance, when you're in a conditional. And that you do uh, uh, using subtyping. So subtyping works as follows. So you have um, derived the judgment, let's maybe start with that one. There, so there are two rules for subtyping, one for the right-hand side and one for the left-hand side. And this is the one for the uh, right-hand side. So assume you have derived already something that has type B and I always mix this up so then you can also go to a super type. Yeah, so you have derived something more um, specialized so you can also like generalize to the super type. Yeah, and in our case, um, what do we have to say for the uh, potential here? So if you, if you think about like again what the meaning is of these types, so yeah, we have this potential, we have to pay for the cost and for the potential of the remaining, uh, or, 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 or potential of the, of the next program state or like the value that we get. So it's always okay to have a little less potential. Yeah? So that means in the subtyping relation, and there's a subtype here, Yeah, in the subtyping relation, we're going to say like, okay, all these potential annotations in the B prime have to be less than in, in the B. So let me define the subtyping. So maybe, maybe do it here. So subtyping. So bool is a, yeah, of, of course, as usual, it's uh, defined inductively. So bool is a subtype of bool. A1, A2 is a subtype of B1, B2, if A1 is a subtype of B1, and A2 is a subtype of B2. Okay, and the interesting case is um, L, P of A is a subtype of L, Q, of B, if, well, A is a subtype of B, and 
P is greater or equal to Q. Yeah, so the sign is flipped because if you look at this rule here, yeah, the potential has to get less when you go down. That's exactly what, what we're saying. Okay? And if you have like a, a, a type in the context here, then you can always increase the potential. Okay? So that's the uh, super type rule. Which looks as follows. So assume you have derived something that has used type A here in our context. So what you need then, and you want to have something that uses A prime instead. <coughs> then the potential of the A um, has to go up. So um, the uh, A prime, no, the potential of the A has to go down, sorry. The, so the um, A prime is a subtype of the A. OK, so if I uh, derived something with potential A, then I can also derive the same thing by using a bit more. Now that's what it says here. Now, so I get kind of like a weaker uh, uh, judgment here. And I need that, for, for, for instance, at the conditional rule to even things out. OK, good. So um, these are the structural rules. Um, there is one more structural rule that you have seen already the uh, weakening. So here um, you simply add this variable x to the context. And what do you have to do with the uh, uh, potential on A? Do you have to require anything? So you don't have to require anything because, again, your bound just gets weaker. So you just have a little bit more potential. OK? So yeah, you don't have to, to restrict A at all. Good. So one last rule. Um, let's see. Maybe I have to delete those. Over here. So yeah, we had this uh, sharing construct in the language. And the question was, what is this good for? And now we're going to see what it's good for. It helps us to split up the potential if we use a variable multiple times, right? I mean, if you, if you use a variable multiple times, then you can't just you know, have the same type at, at both um, 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 places, yeah, because if you would do that, then you would just double the potential. And that would, of course, be unsound. So in the share rule, uh, we account for the situation. So uh, it looks as follows. So um, we have a variable x type a that we're going to share. As x1, x2 in an expression e. So here, in the affine type system that you've seen before, we uh, just wrote x1a, x2a here. And you're wondering, what is 
the point of, of doing that. And here we can't do that anymore. Here we have to change the type, so we have to say, okay, here you have to have A1 and A2, okay? And there needs to be some relation between A, A1 and A2, namely the potential is split up between them. So here um, we write that as, and that's a, a thing that's inductively defined, I define it in a moment, uh, we have this sharing operation. Um, that says potential A is shared between potential in A1 and A2. Okay, and this is defined as follows, inductively again. So you can always share a Boolean without any re restrictions. So when you share uh, a pair, um, A1, A2, let me see what names I use for that. Okay, yeah, that's probably smarter. So I share um, A, B with A1, B1, and A2, B2. Well, then I have to share um, the stuff in A with A1 and A2, and the stuff in B with B1 and B2. Uh, A is shared with A1, A2, and B is shared with B1, B2. Okay, um, for the list, So that's again like the interesting case. This um, Q A one R A two. Okay, if um, A is shared with A1, A2. And, yeah, what has to hold for P, R, and Q? Yeah, when I share a list, and I want to use it twice, what has to happen to the potential? Exactly, it has to get split up. So it's P equals R plus Q here. Okay, so, so those are the Structural rules. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on um, to soundness then. So, in the soundness theorem, also tells us what these types mean formally.
Okay, it's theorem. Okay, there's one thing I haven't defined, but we need it here. So, um, and this is well-formedness. So, well-formedness just says um, we have an <coughs> environment V um, and a context gamma that fit together. Meaning, in our in evaluation environment, okay, we when we um, when gamma says okay um, x has type bool, yeah, then um, it's, it's better in the environment, true or false. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Okay? If it says, like in gamma, okay, we have like a list of bools, yeah, then um, we expect in, in V to have a list of bools. Okay? So the type fits with the data. Okay? That's simply what, what this judgment says. I don't want to define it um, formally. Yeah, you can figure that out yourself, I think. Okay, so if you have a, a well-formed environment, and um, 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 so you have a evaluation um, of uh, E to a value V, so in particular, um, we assume already here in the soundness theorem that um, E is already terminating in this environment V. This is um, nothing we have to do, so you can prove this theorem in a different way, um, and you, you can uh, such that, for instance, evaluation step bounds proof termination. But we're not going to do it here simply because it's easier like that. But we don't have to do it that way. But here we assume basically um, E terminates, and this is another thing that I haven't defined. Um, so this is basically the same judgment that you've seen with a Q and Q prime here with the cost where just like the cost is, is raised. You know? Alternatively, you can think of it, okay, you have that for some um, Q, Q prime here. Okay, and um, we have a, a type derivation for some sigma. And E has type B. Okay, so then falling holds for all. P and C. If you start the program evaluation with sufficient resources that is given by the input potential, yeah, potential of gamma uh, plus Q plus a little bit more, and I'm going to come to that in a, in a second, um, then uh, there exists P prime that is bigger or equal to the output potential, yeah, small v under b plus q prime plus the c again, such that we can evaluate e starting with p, having left over p prime, getting value v. So this is the soundness of the analysis. Yeah. So for a moment, forget about this uh, z here. Yeah. So what does it mean? So if you can evaluate the expression in v, um, and you get small v as as a value, then you can also do the same um, using basically the resources as specified by your input potential, right? So you have this P here, and the P is given by your input potential, okay? By the gamma and the Q, okay? And then the evaluation will not get stuck, 
Yeah, so you have enough resources because if you wouldn't have enough resources, the evaluation would get stuck. But this will not happen, so you will also arrive at this uh, value V here, and the resulting potential, uh, the, the resulting resources that you have, or the leftover resources, are larger or equal to as specified by the output potential here. Yeah, namely the B and the Q prime. So the, yeah, the um, C here is kind of like um, an addition that you need to make this theorem a little bit stronger to uh, make the induction go through. Yeah? So how would you, speaking of induction, so how would you prove this theorem? Induction, yeah, but on what? So what are the what are the options that you have? Pardon? Yeah, the, the typing judgment and the evaluation judgment, right. So either the this evaluation judgment here or um, this typing judgment here. And yeah, so so what would you think? Yeah, the typing judgment is a good idea, but the problem that you have is in the, um, because we have recursion, okay, so what happens in the function application um, basically is that you have to kind of like reuse the type derivation for the body of the function. So this, you know, might, so, and, and when you do that, um, your type derivation might get bigger at this point, so the induction will fail at that. So what you rather have had to do is you have to do a nested induction on the evaluation judgment and the type judgment. And the reason you have to do that is, I mean, you could say like, okay, it's, it's good enough to do induction on the uh, evaluation judgment here, but the problem is that you have these structural rules. So um, when you then, you know, want to reason um, um, yeah, about the, 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 the type derivation, what you, what you have to do is you, you don't make progress on the proof. And that's why you need this inner induction on the type derivation. So it's kind of like a nested induction. Yeah? So because of the recursive functions, we can't do it on the type judgment. Uh, and because of the structural type rules, we can't do it on the evaluation judgment alone. So we have to do nested induction. And so the proof is then, yeah, after you figured that out, the proof is relatively straightforward, um, except for the lead case, where you need um, this funny Z here. So when you try to prove it for, for the lead, for the E1, um, you, you, you sometimes get things, or like you, you, in the proof, you get a, a something that will not quite fit, and you have to make your, yeah, your induction um, hypothesis a bit stronger as often to make it go through. But this is kind of like a detail, um, but I just wanted to mention it. And the, yeah, so the, the Sauna theorem um, that I like better um, uses um, different cost semantics that I didn't introduce. Um, so there, in like this different semantics, I mentioned it already, you can have partial. Um, evaluation. So it's not like, like this one here, which is kind of like this resource safety where you start with like a, a available resources and you can run out of resources. This other semantics is, is more like, okay, you run it and then you get the high water mark and the leftover. Yeah, and there's only, you know, um, one such pair, namely like the uh, minimal one um, that, that you have like for, for this semantics. And if you take this semantics and then you can um, kind of like have these um, 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 partial um, evaluations and that's um, what you can do to move uh, this evaluation judgment um, on the uh, right hand side and you don't need it there anymore. Um, and then you use like a nicer soundness theorem. Okay. Good, so questions about the soundness?
Good, very good. So then we move on to the type inference. And the type inference, so let me maybe just define it first. So we're going to do it by example, because that's the best way to understand it. But let me maybe first write down what the problem is we're trying to solve. So we don't want to um, talk about type inference for like these simple classic type systems. And we just assume that we already have a type derivation for the you know simple types with lists and bools and so on given without these resource annotations. And then our type inference problem is to add these like resource annotations to it. So type inference. OK, we have um, given a uh, yeah, simple, meaning with our resource annotations, yeah, simple signature um, sigma 0 and a well-typed program program um, given by these EFs, YFs, for all Fs in the signature. And so the question we're trying to answer is, um, is there a resource annotated type Oh, a resource annotated signature first. Signature sigma um, such that for every f, for every function in the sigma zero. Now we have an annotated type for some p, p prime. And the type derivation for the function body. Now, of course, the type derivation that fits the function type. OK, makes sense. So basically, you have a program. You have a type derivation without these annotations. And now you want to know, is there one? Um, and you, as usual, you also want to find it yeah, that has these resource annotations. Um, so yeah, do you think this is a decidable problem? No. Yes. Exactly. So, um, you, well, you already like yeah. Exactly. You already like thinking ahead a bit. So if you yeah look at all these annotations we have here and you look at the relations between them as given in the type rules, then you see that you only have linear constraints. 
And that's exactly the case. So you have, in fact, for uh, a program, well, let's say like for a given simple type derivation, the linear constraints you, you have as given by uh, these type rules are actually linear in the size of the derivation. So in every rule, you only uh, produce a constant number, well, it's not entirely true, um, of uh, these inequalities. The places where you don't produce a constant number is where you have the subtyping that you've just seen. Uh, I deleted it and the sharing. But there, kind of like, it is bounded by the size of your types. So if you say, like, okay, that's part of the derivation, then it's linear. Okay, so, and then we have linear constraints, and you can solve these linear constraints in polynomial time uh, using um, the interior point method. So that's a, a, a linear constraint solving algorithm. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this is um, in P time. Okay, so let's see how we do that um, by example. So the idea is, yeah, we take our, our append again. That's why I went through this example earlier so that we can use it now. And we start with type derivation just in this affine type system that you've seen. So we remove all these annotations here, and we get a type derivation in this. Oh, simple affine type system. And what we're going to do is we replace them with unknown variables that we want to determine. OK. So what I do is I just add at all the places where um, these annotations are supposed to be, I add um, new names. So here, for instance, here we add Q, Q prime, and this is just a variable now, okay? And we don't know what number to put there yet. Okay, and we do that um, for all these positions. So let's say here we have Q1, here we have Q2, here we have Q3 um, for those here, maybe let's use R1, <coughs> R2, R, R prime. So here, let's maybe use P, P1, P2, P, P prime. Still, we don't know what they are going to be. P3 here, um, S, maybe S1. S2, S, S prime, S3 here, <coughs> maybe here is T, T1, T2, T, T prime, T3. Now here we have U. U1, U, U prime, U2, and here um, for the signature we do the same thing. So let's say we have V1, V2, V, V prime, V3. Okay, clearly you can do that. These are just variables. Okay, and we don't know what it is yet. They're going to have, like at the end of the day, 
they're going to be these rational numbers. Okay, but we want to figure out um, what they are. So to this end, um, we're going to write down linear constraints. So now we recall what was required in the type rules. Unfortunately, uh, they are not here anymore. But uh, we have to just recall what they said. So in the match rule, for instance, well, what it said is like, OK, this potential Q, what you have here, well, that has to be the same as the R. Yeah, because we have no cost, yeah. Let's do again like our case where we only pay for the cons operations, yeah. So the cost for the match is zero. So what we're gonna have here is just R equals Q. Okay, this is one constraint that we collect. Another constraint that we collect is that R prime is equal to Q prime. Okay, also from the match rule, what we know is that, okay, the type, yeah, and the rule it was B, okay, has to be the same. So uh, meaning here we have to have B, um, here at this place in the E1 we have to have B, and here in the E2 we have to have B. Now for us, that means that the P3 and the R2 and the Q3 are the same. This was supposed to be some script. Okay, what else? So um, here the um, y. So this was just like in the in the um, context gamma in the rule. So the same thing. Yeah, the gamma stays the same. So we just have uh, q two equals P2 uh, equals R1. OK, so um, then what we still have to relate is the um, Q and P here, um, and the Q1 and the P1. So the Q1 and the P1 is just going to be the same. And the Q plus the spill that you get, and the spill was this Q1. Has to be uh, the P. Yeah, this is where the spill is going to happen, and you can express all this with these uh, linear constraints. Okay, and then the question is always, yeah, I mean, yeah, we could do that um, um, further, but I think the, the thing um, that's interesting is, yeah, where um, you're going to close the loop, yeah, because um, you have this recursive call at some point, and, but that's super simple. It's just like another type rule, um, because here, um, yeah, that's where you kind of like close the loop here, you want to relate basically this um, V1 um, uh, with um, what you had down here. So that's like one thing you do. So you just say like, OK, um, V1 is Q1, uh, V2 is Q2. Then you say, OK, V is Q, V prime is Q prime. V3 is Q3. So that's all. And of course, what you also have to say is that like the V1 um, and uh, the Vs are equal to the Ts. So, um, so you have the same thing here. So you have like V1 equals T1, V2 equals T2, and 
uh, v equals t, v prime equals t prime, uh, v3 equals t3. And of course, the t's going to be linked back through like all the constraints we generate here to the q's. And that's how you kind of like get your uh, loop. Okay, so we take all of our constraints and we send it to an LP solver and we say uh, solve these constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So the question is how um, are we used, like what was the, the relaxed rule in, in the type derivation? Yes, so very good questions. Uh, question. Uh, again, yeah, we have these um, uh, structural rules and we can apply that, uh, the, these rules at any point in the derivation. So um, as it turns out, it's very easy to integrate them with the other rules. So we, what we have to do before we do the type inference, I forgot to mention that, is we have to take the structural rules and combine them with uh, the, the um, um, uh, syntax-directed rules so that we have, again, a syntax-directed type system so that we can do inference. And um, so the relaxed rule, for instance, we only need it um, at the match, at the pattern match, Basically, we need it at every point where you branch, at the conditional, at the pattern match, and that's where you want to do the, the relax rule, and in the function application, as we have seen, because that's a place where you often want to pass through a constant. So these kind of like two pl places, um, 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 same for the subtyping. Yeah? These are the places where you use subtyping and relax. And these are probably all, oh no, then like the weakening, um, is another one. So the weakening, we just push it up to the leaves. Yeah, we just weaken at the leaves. So there we would just um, um, have instead of the variable rule where we have to have exactly the variable in the context, we just would allow like, you know, a larger context and we would just weaken implicitly at that point. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the question was why don't we have any constants in here? And the um, answer was already yeah, <laughs> implied by the question is so because we have a very simple resource metric where we only pay for the cons. So let's say you know you had some cost for the um, pattern match, yeah, then um, you would have like a constant here, let's say like okay, the R is one less than what you had before. Yeah, something like that. <coughs> Okay, more questions. Yes. Oh, what, what, what do you mean by, uh, oh, okay, if you, um, so you're asking about if you want to use a pen multiple times. Oh, yeah, so that's, we assume that's given already. Yeah, we have this function signature because we have this like first order um, uh, model. And um, yeah, they are like, we say, okay, the signature is already given. And then we just, you know, annotate it with fresh names and then we, we take it from there. Oh, you're, you're unhappy with this answer? <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah so you have to basically, um, so that's basically what happens here, right? So you have to link the signature with a function body. 
So basically you say like, okay, you know, you, if, if you, so you say, okay, I propose to use this annotation for, for a pen. I mean, that's already a question I think that applies to not only the type inference, but also to the original type system. So you propose, okay, I want to annotate, you know, a pen with these numbers. Okay, then I say, well, okay, to, if you want to do that, then you have to give me a type derivation for the function body where you use these numbers in your initial context here and in your result type. And that's where you make the link only if you can derive that using, if you want, for recursive calls, you know, what, what, you, what you want to prove, um, then it is legal. Good, okay, so for a pen, for instance, let's see um, if we can. figure that out so so let's try to um, summarize uh, the constraints for a pen with like a smaller constraint set so you can see already here I mean you get like um, um, a constraint that, that you can simplify yeah? you have all these equalities and you can remove them um, and you get a, a, a simpler constraint system so, and since we're talking about that already, um, so these constraints have, a, a, um, I think in the case of a linear type system, maybe it's even entirely true um, that there are these um, network problems. They are called NLP solving. So they have a, a, a very simple shape, um, um, like here with the R, okay, so um, or let, let's, Put it the other way around, yeah, where you have here this cost, let's say the cost is one plus R equals Q. And um, so things of this shape, yeah, where you have like a Q equals R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus a constant, this is called like a, a network constraint. And these constraints can be solved very fast in practice by LP solvers. So that takes only linear time. I don't think there's any theoretical work um, on this, I, I don't think there's a, a proof that this runs in, in linear time because I mean they usually use simplex, which is exponential anyways. But um, they are, yeah, usually solved in, in linear time in practice, um, which is nice. Uh, okay, but what you can't do is you can't have these solvers um, simplify these constraint systems for you. I mean that would be super nice to have. You know, if you um, write a library and you have all these constraints and then you want to like simplify them into like a small constraint set, you're going to see for a pen we can uh, express them very succinctly, but there are no good tools for that. I mean, there's like um, this one uh, method, I just forgot the, the, the name of it, but that gives you usually during the simplification an exponential flow up. So you, you want to say, okay, I want to remove this uh, variable or dimension, they say, from the, from the constraint set and then um, in the worst case, it, it uh, blows up exponentially if, if you do that. Um, so yeah, so there's no, uh, no good method that I know at least to simplify those. But anyways, so for a pen, we can do it manually. So let's say we have um, Q, Q1, to P P prime and Q three. So the constraint we have them is here. Yeah, maybe you can tell me. So if you just want to summarize all the types for for a pen, um, what constraints do we need? Yeah, again, we want to count the number of cons operations. <coughs> so what's, for instance, the relation of the P and P prime? 
equal? Yeah, well, that's certainly true, but if we want to have all types, so the su suggest uh, suggestion is that uh, uh, P and P prime are equal, but we can also have like a bad type, right, where we say like, okay, you know, we, we just have 10 and then we, we throw it away and we have zero. And I mean, it doesn't make much sense, but it's perfectly legal. Yeah, using the relax rule, if you want to do it like technically. So credo equal is, is good enough. So what about the relation of the um, Q2 and the Q3? Yes, Q2 needs to be greater than the Q3. So what about the Q1 and Q3? Yeah. Exactly. Credo equal to Q3 plus 1 because we have to use it to pay for the cost of the cons operations. So and this um, summarizes all the types for, for a Panthers constraint system. And in practice, so what, what you do to like summarize uh, this type for, for a pen, this can be kind of like seen as a principal type is you would not use this um, nice constraint system, but you would use like this big one here that you get from the type rules. And then um, uh, you have kind of like a, a, a lead polymorphism, yeah, because you have seen um, that it's not good enough to have just one type for the pen. We want multiple types. For instance, if we have like an inner occurrence of the pen. So um, what you do is basically you derive the thing for, for a pen once and for all, and then at every call site, you um, kind of like make a copy of this whole constraint set, give it new names, and then you globally let the LP solver optimize the whole thing. And so, yeah, speaking of optimization, so um, we have this constraint set now, and it describes an infinite number of type annotations that, that we can use here. So how do we know which one is the best? Too many, yeah. What do you mean by best? Yeah, what do I mean by best? Yeah, well, I mean, we wanna, we wanna get um, the, the um, best possible bound for a pen, let's say, yes. Makes inequalities tight, yes, but they are, of course, already kind of tight, right? Make them e equalities, yeah, that would still be an infinite set, I guess, right? Because, like, then you can have, you know, you could have, like, 100 here for the Q3, yeah. and then you would still need a lot for the, for the input. So with LP solving, you can have this thing that's called um, an objective function. And you can tell the LP solver to minimize the objective function, okay? So in this case, we have an uh, objective, for instance, that would say like, okay, um, minimize um, this has always uh, to be uh, a linear expression, so Q1 plus Q2 plus P. So that would be one thing that we can minimize. Yes, minimizing the input potential, exactly. Um, of course here, this is maybe not ideal, so what, 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 what's the problem here um, that, that you see when we just minimize this expression? Yeah? Yes, exactly, so um, 
Oh yeah, sub subtract the output potential. Yeah, that's something we can do that might help. Yeah, so. Um, That doesn't hurt, <laughs> but <laughs> there's, <laughs> there, there, there's still a problem here. So we treat kind of like the linear parts in the same way as the constant parts. So there might be for a pend, I think it's not the case, but there might be other functions where you can pay, you know, um, pay the cost with a linear annotation and also with a constant annotation. So what you want, rather want to say is that the um, minimization of the linear parts uh, should take priority. So one thing you can say, for instance, is okay. You can have like a linear expression here, right? So um, you can just add like you know a, a large constant. I don't know in front of those. So that's one way, but still this is kind of like only a heuristic. So a really nice thing that these LP solvers let you do is so you can um, add constraints and then rerun the solver and um, it will take almost no time. So the solver kind of like makes some decisions to arrive at the solution and the solver will just like memor memorize this pass to the solution and when you add another constraint, it will go super fast. So the trick what we do is, and this is more important in the polynomial system, we're gonna talk about at the next lecture, is um, that we start um, by minimizing um, here in this case, so we start with the highest degree. Here we just have linear um, annotations. So here um, we would first say, okay, yeah, so better first um, minimize Q1 plus Q2, subject of course to our constraints, and then add um, constraint Q1 plus Q2, yeah, whatever your minimal solution was. So your minimal solution will give you uh, values for the Q1, Q2, yeah. And um, well, maybe let's call the solution S, right? So then we say S Q1 plus S Q2 here. Yeah, so this gives you uh, solution S. And then uh, we say three minimize P. Yeah, then you run it again, it almost takes no time and you minimize P. So this, um, yeah, as I said, it's, it's maybe not that important for the linear system, but for the polynomial, it's, it's very important Then you can say, okay, minimize the cubic first and the quadratic and then the linear so you, you really get the um, asymptotic, asymptotically best bound in the end. Okay, so yeah, that's what I uh, have for, for today and then next time we're gonna look how all of this, also the type inference with the linear constraints works for polynomial annotations as well. Um, questions so far? Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, um, it, it's still unclear what um, kind of like the best possible solution is. If you think about like the append example where you have the inner occurrence of a append, um, um, and you need some output potential, right? So, so what is the the best solution in general? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So. Um, what we have to do is we have to analyze a program globally, okay? And then only then at the end of the day we say like the input potential for the whole program, that's the thing we minimize. And uh, what's the best type for a pend then that you maybe use somewhere like in your program is gonna like just determined by that um, 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 optimization problem. Yeah. In, in, for an individual function, you can't do that. So that's why you have to, when you, you know, kind of like have this principal type for a function, you just have these inequalities and you don't, that does not come with an objective function. The objective function you adjust at the end of the day.
to to get the, the best bound for one program. Yes, exactly. Unless you you might be interested in you know the uh, behavior of this particular function, then you can say okay, you know, minimize the thing and then you treat it kind of like as a program. Okay, more questions? Okay, that's it. Thanks.